Hello, everybody. And today I am here interviewing and talking to my new friend here, Ross Boone. He also goes by Ross Spoon, although I was a bit confused by it. He had to explain it to me some. Uh, so just go ahead and introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about what you do, um, your hobby, and what motivates you to create art and if you like helping people and some other things along those lines. Cool, man. Yeah, and first of all, I just want to say thanks for reaching out. I think it's so cool okay. that Instagram and the internet mm-hmm. can connect previously um st- we were just strangers and you mm-hmm. found me and reached out and now we're i feel like we're friends already yeah. like, um my name is ross boone mm-hmm. but my artist name is raw spoon because it sounds mm-hmm. like it um there was a cute girl back in high school that said hey did you know your name sounds like raw spoon and i was like oh, yeah. yeah so like 20 years later or something when i was putting together my artist name i thought oh this could work um I started out in engineering, funny that I am now an artist. Then I went to industrial design, did that for 10 years. That moved me down to Atlanta from Colorado and then uh, got let go, but loved doing art. So I just continued to do art um, as a freelancer. So Mm -hmm. I just like accept clients who come in and ask for me to do artwork for them. Um, But my real purpose that I feel like is... The, the purpose I live my life for is um, using writing and drawing. These are two of my passions and skills um, to try to draw people closer to God. For me, that's where I found the most meaning and how I can give people kind of like a hope bigger than themselves, bigger than um, just the material things of this world. Mm-hmm. And so I do that in the form of digital art and I post a lot of it online on my Facebook and my Instagram mm-hmm. and just hope that people can get encouragement and uh, nuggets of wisdom and truth um, that might be able to improve their lives and their hope and stuff. And yeah, you can get all the, find my Instagram and Facebook okay. and everything through um, rawspoon.com. Okay. I'll uh, leave a link for that in the video so everybody yes. can find that. It'll be below. And if anybody have any questions about that, go ahead and check out his Instagram. And I was going to ask you about, about, about what age did you start drawing? Did you really get it, start getting into it? Man, I remember probably when I was five or six, my mom threw a neighborhood art show where she yeah. put all my drawings I had been doing of like sharks jumping up to eat cars off of bridges and stuff. Yeah. She put those um, little drawings all around our house and invited all the neighbors over for my first like art show. Yeah. So, since I was young, I loved doing it. There, there were stick figures in there, of course, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or even worse. I used, yeah, I, when I was younger, I used to do all these, um, I'd be on the bus, and the other kids would be watching me draw. And you now as you get older, you get more self-conscious about what you're creating, and you're worried about what people think. But when you're a kid, you just don't care. You create whatever. Mm-hmm. And I remember I would be on the bus drawing these, like, little stick figure wars and all this stuff. And it was all very flat looking. There was no three-dimensional to it. But the time, you know, I was just having fun and enjoying it. But then as we get older, you know, we kind of lose that sense of creativity of just being ourselves and not being so worried about what people think. And you know, I think a lot of times that will like hold you back in your creative endeavors because then it makes you try to compare yourself to other people. And then you're not really pursuing something that is because of something you enjoy. Then you're just pursuing it for the end goal rather than the process of doing it. So yeah, I think – one of, sorry to interrupt you. Um, you you um, triggered a good a good idea that I yeah. had. Um, I think, like, um, I think I probably still have that childlike mindset mm-hmm. to a fault because I'm yeah. like, whatever I produce, I want to put it out into the yeah. world. I don't know if I have that filter of thinking yeah. like, am I going to be judged by this? Yeah. Um, but it's been beneficial in my situation, mm-hmm. I think, because it's just so important to be um, producing and iterating. Every time I put something out there, I'm looking for feedback so that I, the next iteration I can make mm-hmm. be better. So yeah. um, even if it's not that awesome, luckily, you know, a- after time you get better and better and your percentage of wins um, mm-hmm. get higher. So, you know, yeah. the number of the things I produce are actually well received. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's, it's yeah. important to put it out there sometimes. So tell me about when, when you started doing freelance artwork at the time, were you working, you know, like the regular nine to five job and how was it kind of transitioning from 
only um, working like a nine to five job, but then you discovered you like your true passion. And then you say to yourself, you know, people might tell me that, you know, I shouldn't pursue this, you know, that's risky or, or they try to tell you all these things you shouldn't do. But as you said, you still have that, you know, kind of a kid mindset to be creative and you say, well, I'll do what I want because it's what I enjoy rather than just going and doing what a lot of people tell you. Kind of tell them the experience of what it was like transitioning to that and how it was with the big move and everything. Um, mm-hmm. All that goes. I think um, if I had planned the move, I would have worked really hard on um, in my free time building mm-hmm. up a business on the side. Yeah. But I got let go. So like mm-hmm. I wasn't really well suited for the nine to five. And mm-hmm. my bosses found that out. We all found that out the hard way. And so they're like, Ross, we got to let you go. So I was mm-hmm. going from one day I had a, had a job, nine to five job to not having anything to do the very next day. Yeah. But luckily I had been doing art in my free time and publishing it on social media. So I was known as um, you know, among my friend circles, they're like, if they need an illustrator, they knew who to come to. So I think that is key to basically be producing stuff, whatever you make. Um, if you have a job, do it in your free time and then publish it online so that people know you are the artist. If they need an artist, they or the people that they, that they would recommend to you um, will come to you. Yeah, it kind of goes back to what you mentioned about just being yourself and not being afraid of what people think. Yep. If you are working that nine to five job every day and you have a passion or something, and let's say that passion is something that to make income from it or to help other people, it has to be out there. They have to see it. But if you're afraid and you let what people think control or stop you from sharing that, then you're never going to get that out there. And it kind of stops you from you know getting there or doing it. Um, yeah, so as, exactly. as far as the, when you started drawing, you said you started drawing, you know, it was a, you said it was a, um, like your mom showed everybody your art and everything you said, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And about what age was it that you felt that you should start pursuing this more as far as, um, really putting your artwork out there more and trying to like start a business or start a company or starting your own brand and like really helping people or was it always just there? But it was more so that you just got ideas from other people from socializing. And then through that, you've kind of figured out what it is that you wanted to do. Hmm. You know, I think it was just built in me that if I produced something, I want people to see it. So it was a pretty natural transition that whenever I would make something, I would put it out there. And this led to business um, Mm -hmm. coming back to me. Um, And I remember throughout my life, when I look back, um, I remember my art being praised and my other passion writing, never really finding that same sort of um, praise from people. Mm -hmm. So um, we could talk about this in a second, but I am a big fan of looking at not only what you're passionate about, but what you're talented at Mm -hmm. and combining that with what your struggles have been to create a message for people. So going back to answer your question more directly, um, the reason um, I started producing what I produce is because I, some of the struggles that I've been through specifically for me struggles with my faith and mm-hmm. doubt yeah. um, gave me a message to tell because I came up with solutions and I said, cool, this is how, this is something that has helped me with my life. I want to help other people with it. Um, and at, at first I thought my most productive medium to do that was through writing because you can write ideas down. You can kind of make logical arguments and stuff like that. But it just wasn't received as readily as my artwork was. So over time, I've had to figure out how can I leverage the bits of ideas I communicate, I can communicate through writing, but in the package of artwork, because that's received better. Um, So I've like, um, basically said, how can I help people? Okay, I have this message that I want to tell. What's the package I deliver it in? It's going to be a mixture of writing, but like, more so art, like maybe it's the writing is the caption for the art or the art goes along with the story, but they see the art first, so they get drawn in. Um, And just that passion to help people with what I feel like I have to give was the motivator to make me um, produce and put it out there. Mm -hmm. And going back, what you said about uh, helping other people, I think that, you know, sometimes some people might have a struggle they're going through in life or something that's difficult. And a lot of times when you see that as negative, 
but most of the people I know that I've seen that have gone through a lot of struggles, they're really appreciative of what they do have, even if they don't have as much as people that might be most, more skilled than them. And that kind of goes back as well as, as far as comparing yourself to other people. If you're appreciative of what you have in life, then you won't have that stress or that worry of, hey, I don't have this or I'm, I'm not as skilled as this person. You'll keep doing what you enjoy. And even though you might think that you're not as talented as them, you might have something else that you can bring to it that they might not have. For example, you might have someone that's an artist can draw really good, but that's pretty much all they're really good at. And they might not be good at speaking or helping other people or sharing their experiences. I think that's the most important thing beyond just being good at art. There's, I mean, I wouldn't say anybody. It kind of depends on uh, how much you are at uh, being patient with time. You know, it takes a really long time to get really good at drawing to draw things realistically. I mean, a lot of people can draw realistically, but the most important message getting across is what can I create and what can I do that I can also use other things that I'm good at to help me in this area of my life that I can then help people and connect with them. And that can be if you're introverted or if you're extroverted, either way you can still find that connection within yourself and the people around you. Yeah, man. Um, uh, you, you triggered two thoughts in me that yeah. uh, might contribute. Um, the first thought about comparison is that like, I like to try to, th- think like I'm not going to be judged on my performance compared to other people. There are more, there are people who are more talented than me. You yeah. can do more with it. They're, they're smarter than me. Yeah. Um, what I would be, will be judged against and what I will be happy to be able to say I did at the end of my life is did I do the best with what I have been given? Mm-hmm. Maybe someone else who um, um, has been given more, can become famous faster yeah. or, you know, do, but if I've made the most with what I have, then that is, that is what I should strive for. Yeah. Um, and then number two, I think it's great to combine your different interests or mm-hmm. passions with skills or whatever, because you're totally right. It, yeah. You get a unique niche that makes you best at doing what you are built to do when you combine those things and put mm-hmm. it in the direction of what you've struggled through mm-hmm. because then you have a platform to give your answers that have helped you through the struggle back yeah. to people who are earlier on in that struggle. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I do um, um, something called mission maps for people okay. that maybe I can bring it up on my screen. Alrighty. Um, oops, do this. All right, so can you see my screen okay? Yeah, I can see it good. Okay, now let's, this is my website, and um, as it pulls up. Okay, so here is a book that I'm working on, The Millennial Monk, Living a Life Devoted to Purpose Instead of the American Dream. And I just do a bunch of these things called mission maps with people, um, where we talk about the topics in the book and help them figure out what they're built to do by combining their like abilities or strengths here on that left-hand side circle and then listening to their passions, what they love doing, what they'll stay up late at night doing, what they did when they were a little kid and then finding the overlap with their struggles. What are those things that they've struggled with in life um, which has given them answers that they can give back through the medium of their abilities and passions. So how this takes form for me is that I've struggled with doubt and faith and I'm my abilities are writing and my passions I'm sorry my abilities are my ability my main ability is um, art my main passion is writing so this this combination of all three is to do writing and art to help draw people closer to God or to overcome their doubts Um, yeah yeah thanks for letting me share that Oh, you're welcome. When I, when I look at that, it kind of reminds me of like the, um, like, you know, the two diagrams where it shows, um, like if you're comparing things or looking at something, like for example, when I uh, moved back from California in 2013, back to Ohio, I was debating on moving back or not. And I had you know, two diagrams of the good, the bad and mutual things. It kind of reminded me of that. Yeah. And before I decided to move, I was like, you know, what are the, the good things about moving back and what are the bad things? And everything was like pretty much exactly even, but on the right column, it said affordability pros of moving back to Ohio. And I was like, well, 
all this stuff in this size is not going to matter if I can't afford to live here because the rent was really expensive. It's kind of reminding me of that. But I like how you had that set it up, like you said, with writing. So it's a visual thing, but there is some writing in it. And so you're using that to help explain things better, which can, um, you can make it more detailed, um, where you can explain it to adults, but you can also make it simplified more to where children can understand it. You could have that as something that kids could have in classrooms and see. And mm. I think that what you're doing is really good as far as sharing that. And I think it's really going to help people as far as figuring out what um, you know, they like to do. Cool, man. Thank you. Yeah, if um, any of your fans would like to do a mission map, um, we could do like a Skype call and talk through okay. it or something. Yep, there's another one. Um, cool. About how, about how many of those um, mission maps have you made? Is there a no. series? Yeah, um, I think I've done 25 or so, something like okay. that. Um, but I've, I've given classes to, I mean, um, I've, I've spoken to people probably in the a hundred or hundreds yeah. of different people I've talked talked to about it. I haven't done an actual mission map of all of them, all of those people yet. Yeah. And like you said, as far as, or what I said about um, learning it, sometimes some, somebody can see, you know, when you're going back to writing and you didn't feel like only doing writing was your thing and incorporate other stuff where like, say you get an entire wall of text or whatever, it's like, I have to read through all this, try to understand it. Kind of like yeah. if like, like a child's book, when there's a lot of more pictures in it, they're more interested in it and they can um, learn more from it faster. Whereas mm -hmm. if it's just a bunch of words, you're like, Oh, it's this wall of text that you have to try to get through and the pictures and everything make it a lot um, easier for them to understand. But it's also something that you enjoy doing as we're saying, yeah. you know, helping other people and helping them figure out what they like to do in their passions in life. So, yeah, that's right. And um, so a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. uh, I started working for a company, so I, I, I still freelance, but I work for them about one day a week where I go into a conference that they send me to and I take visual notes. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I can pull something up to show. Okay. On that. So the company is called The Sketch Effect. It's here in Atlanta. And um, they basically taught me how to do visual thinking and recording of a talk visually um maybe my instagram will have some so here's an example of stuff i've done at, at uh, my my church services um i listen to the talk that the pastor is giving and then i just do visual notes um, for the whole talk so that somebody can mm -hmm. take a glance at the <clears throat> at the picture and get an idea of what the what the talk was about mm -hmm. but like what you're talking about taking a um, what could be a block of text and putting a lot of visuals to it for us visual learners out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So my um, next question I have here is, do you do anything as far as helping people outside of just the um, sketch maps? What are some other things that you do like to help your community or people around you? Um, you know, it's, it's kind of a challenge to figure out where my giftings mm -hmm. overlap with people's needs. Yeah. Um, I guess one thing that I've tried to figure out how to help and one way I've, I've found out can help is, um, you know, when you have a homeless person that asks you for money, you're like, Oh, how do yeah. I help? Is money actually going to help them? Cause they might spend yeah. it on drugs or something. Um, mm -hmm. so this is what I started doing. I said, Hey, I would love to interview you and put it on my blog and I'll buy it buy a lunch. Um, if I can interview you and sometimes I'll just give them cash. Yeah. Um, but I feel like I'm, it's an exchange of a service and it's valuable to me because I get to share their story and the things that they've learned through their pretty gritty life with people who live in a really safe kind of like, you know, middle class yeah. existence. Um, there's so many lessons they've learned and they, in general, they like that their story is being told, mm -hmm. um, and I have content to share with my, my viewers. So mm -hmm. I've been interviewing people like that and putting it on my blog. Okay. One of them was a homeless guy that was coming to our church, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and what he would do at our church was do live poetry for people, mm -hmm. and he would like listen to the, the sermon, and he would write down poetry 
in while it was being said, or he like um, talked to someone who had just had a baby or just lost a parent and he would write poetry for them and give it to them. And I thought that was just so amazing that someone who had so little was using yeah. his giftings to give back. So I did a piece of art for him. Let me see if I can find it real quick. Um, share this again. Um, can you see my screen okay? Yeah, I can see. Okay, so here is uh, my friend Twin. He was the homeless um, friend who was coming to our church. You can see our, our church in the background. But I did this piece of art that, oh, that's not it. Um, that a guy in New York saw because I posted it and invited me to be part of their, their art show in Manhattan that was benefiting the homeless. I'm looking for the piece of art. Um, oh gosh, I, I guess it was a long time ago. Um, and uh, so I said, yes, I'd love to be part of your, your art show. And uh, where is it? So we raised money so that twin my homeless friend mm -hmm. could fly up and be with us at the art show. So, all right, well, I guess I'm not going to find it down on my photo stream. <laughs> um, so the most recent uh, iteration of this is the art show itself. So okay. you can see on the far right where my mouse is, that was the piece of art that I did on Photoshop. It was just basically overlaying a photo of him with a photo of his sheets of poetry. So okay. that's what got found on Instagram and that's what got us invited to this art show. But when we were there, I used a bunch of pieces of twins poetry, actual pieces of paper, put them, taped them on this wall, and then drew a picture of his face mm -hmm. on top of those pieces of poetry. So um, we figured not only can we help twin by giving him the dignity of being in a New York art show, but we can also sell off each individual page of his artwork. So we sold each page for $20. Mm -hmm. And the story behind it was we are trying to help a homeless man who gives so much to his community take a piece of this artwork, the piece of, one of these pieces of poetry, and you can take it home after you buy it. And remember, you can remember that it is part of a bigger story. Mm -hmm. um, you have bought a piece of artwork that is now, you know, this story has touched people across this nation, mm -hmm. other people who have bought pieces of this artwork. So that is just a way that I've um, tried to use my skill set um, and my resources to help um, people in need. Oh, here's a picture of, mm -hmm. here's Twin describing his artwork at the show. Mm -hmm. Or describing his poetry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this was in uh, Manhattan, you said? Yeah, Manhattan. Okay. It was four, four blocks away from the World Trade Center. Oh, wow. Uh, area. So it was, it was pretty awesome. Um, we just got back a couple weeks ago. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Cool. It kind of looked, the, the picture of it kind of looks like from a distance as if all the text itself is making the image rather mm -hmm. than it being drawn on it, you know what I mean? So yep, that's what that I was my, when I first seen it, I'm like, wait a second, is that all the text that's like aligned in a way that makes it look that way? Or is dude, it that drawn was my on top vision. of it? Yeah. At first I was going to try to figure out how to do that, but yeah. then I gave up because it was so freaking hard that I, so yeah. I just drew, drew on the top of it or did the Photoshop yeah. image. Yeah. I imagine you, like an artist like yeah. me. It, I'd imagine it'd be very difficult because you'd have to have some, some text more bold or larger and then some, um, smaller italicized but i think that would be something interesting to try is if yep. you took some of his poetry and did that but like you said it'd be a lot of work to try to figure out how to do that i did something sort of in this vein mm -hmm. um i hope i can find it. oh yeah so check this out so this um this is a famous piece of it was built off of a famous piece of artwork called the prodigal son let me see if i can um did this piece of art with with words like I took a text from a novel that I like mm -hmm. um, The Road by Cormac McCarthy which deals with some father and son um, themes mm -hmm. and then I just spaced the words in such a way so that you can vaguely see the, the image of the prodigal son in the background or in the shape okay. of the words but that was kind of also inspired by the yeah. idea that you and I both had about how to turn words into art 
what what program did you use to do that? Because um, I would imagine, like, if I was trying to do it on WordPad or something, I might, like, accidentally have someone caps locks and, or accidentally have everything copied and, like, delete backspace on accident or something. So what, what program did you do that on? Was it Photoshop or? So Illustrator, Adobe okay. Illustrator is a little bit better in text than Photoshop is. So I think I did okay. it in Illustrator. A lot of like space bars and a lot of like adjusting mm -hmm. the kerning. Okay. The text and stuff. Yeah. About how long did it take you to, to create that? Oh man. <laughs> I think that was the second version of it. And I think total I probably put um, maybe eight or nine hours of okay. eight hours of work into it. Seven or eight. After yeah. you were done, were you just seeing letters and words everywhere, like dreaming about letters? <laughs> yeah, just thinking. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't want to read text anymore for the next month. <laughs> I know. Although I look at it, I'm like, oh, I could be improved. Maybe I should jump yeah. back in. <laughs> then you start on it and like, oh, this is, this is a lot. Of, I, I wonder why. You know, it's a lot of work. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, Jacob, how about um, you tell me a little bit about what you're excited about these days. What is some art that you're excited to do? And feel free to share your screen okay. if you have any visuals. Um, I mostly do a lot of abstract art. I also do um, some realism. I try to get it more into like hyper realism. And for me, I never felt that I was really talented at it. It was just that I was extremely passionate about it. And as you said, not comparing yourself or worrying about what people think. And I didn't let the fact that I didn't feel that I was super talented hold me back. I just kept yeah. trying and trying because mm -hmm. you can get a lot farther in life if someone that doesn't have a talent if they try really hard then someone that has a talent but just wastes their time um it just squanders it doesn't do anything with it but i mostly do abstract art i do a little bit of realism i like to make um, inspirational videos motivation um, help people get through stress in life help them find their purpose and sense of meaning um because i i really just want to help other people because i understand what it's like to go through the struggles to go through all the hard times and you feel like just giving up and you feel that there's not much of a purpose or a reason in life. And I always used everything that happened to me, um, all the struggles throughout my entire life. And things started to get a bit better the past few years when I started to figure myself out more. Mm -hmm. And I really channeled everything that bothered me, all my stress, anger, anxiety, into creating things. And then I just create the art. Most of the time when I go to create something, I don't really have an idea. It's just that... I just create, I just let it happen. Because when I start thinking about it too much, especially when creating abstract, I get kind of like an artist block. And then I start to feel like anxiety, like I don't know what to make. So I just, I just grab a, whatever pen, I've got like hundreds of pens back there. I just grab some random one and I just start dueling and drawing stuff. And it ends up being something and I end up creating something that's more detailed, intricate, and I find it interesting to create. Then if I sit down and think for half an hour, you no, know, what am I going to draw? Because that's half an hour I could have spent doing something yeah. rather than spending and wasting the time um, not creating. And I've so far, I've done a little bit over 400 videos on my channel in the past oh year gosh. now so far. But the most difficult thing for me is actually the video editing. Um, I actually spend more time doing video editing than yeah. I a lot of times in drawing. And forever. So some days it's like, and I want to do drawing, but it's like, I want to spend more time getting better, but it's like, I also want to edit and I want to share it. But I think that through the struggle of that, as, I, as we were talking about getting over obstacles and challenges in life, the obstacle of trying to learn how to you know, build a computer, how to use a video editor and all this stuff. Now that I know how to do it, I don't have to go out and hire a bunch of people to go and do it for me where I can yeah. just save the money and do it myself. I can be more self-reliant. And through that, I, I was able to create the content that I do. And I feel like you said with the sketch maps that you have, you know, of incorporating different things together to where I learned these different skills that help me and improve my artwork. Now I've had to learn video editing, audio editing. I've had to learn how to use, you know, all these microphones, my camera equipment, DSLR, the different lenses, different art mediums, use different papers and um, all the different parts of building a computer. Um, like when I built this one, I actually had to build a new computer about a month ago because the one I had before, I built it in 2015 and I built it specifically, you know, just mostly for gaming. And I kind of like got into gaming at that time. I had a lot of stuff going on in my life and I was really stressed. And so I started doing more gaming to try to get my mind off of stuff. 
But the way it was built then was just for gaming. It was horrible video editing. I tried to edit video render. It would just freeze. It would crash. I was like, ah. So I had to like record at lower resolution and everything. But as far as what I do, what I like to do is to just take everything that I've gone through and just put that into art for other people to see. And if they see something in it, I feel like I'm connecting to that person through my art. And I've always been more of an introverted person and I didn't really have much of anybody to talk to growing up. And so I feel like now I can connect to people better through my art rather than just, you know, going out there, you know, hang out with a bunch of friends and everything. Although I do like socializing and I'm trying to get out a little bit more um, because most of the time I just either work or draw and um, kind of like our conversation now is probably the most I've talked to anybody in quite a while, <laughs> ironically, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, my Instagram, uh, Jay Sheets artwork. Yeah. I'm uh, looking at it right now. I've, I've, I've posted some pictures on there, but there's like hundreds I haven't posted because mm. I've got to like take the picture and then post it and then add the tags and then edit it. And it's just a lot of work with everything else I'm doing. I'm trying to go back and forth between so many different um, platforms that yeah. can be kind of a bit of an overload load some days. So. Totally, man. Yeah, that's that weird balance of mm -hmm. producing art or spreading the art. Mm -hmm marketing all that stuff balance yeah just if, this year i finally started hiring people to do some of my more repetitive tasks like writing my um subscriber emails or doing posts on facebook and stuff that was a funny picture <laughs> yeah so when i asked like what are you up to and i like, sent this picture and like uh i got a new paper today i'm drawing with what do you think <laughs> <laughs> it looks like a cool piece of art too yeah yeah neat stuff i like all your um I really like these mm -hmm. patterns that you fill shapes with. So, yeah, we like we had mentioned, I'm looking forward to doing a collaborative project where yeah. my thought is that I'll, I'll give you some basic outline shapes that create some sort of something, and then I'd love to see um, what patterns you fill the inside with yeah. of those big shapes. Yeah, this is great. A lot of these um, drawings you can see on here, there's a bunch yeah. that are unfinished because this was back um, – I think it was, yeah, this was before I actually had my YouTube channel. I started my YouTube channel, I think it was like spring of 2018. And so I didn't have to worry about you know, setting up all the camera equipment and I didn't have to worry about having the paper in a certain direction. And so I was starting a drawing. I'd work on it 30 minutes. I'd have another idea, pick up uh, another piece of paper, be halfway yeah. done, have another idea. And so I've got hundreds of drawings that are like halfway done. Huh. And I just go back to them from time to time and try to finish them. Cool. Well, I mean, most of them look fairly finished and mm. maybe that's just because patterns like who's to say that it's done or not. You could go on forever. Yeah. I guess like this one, you can say, Oh yeah, he didn't finish that one. Wheel. Yeah. I was oh, in this, okay. in this phase for a while while I was doing like a lot of Zentangle like type of stuff. What's Zentangle? It's kind of where it's hard to explain. It's kind of like doodling, but you, it's, it's kind of like geometric shapes. They're like really curved. Like if you scroll down uh -huh. a little bit, it should be the one above the painting. It should be up a little bit. Oh, upwards. Oh, okay. I'm trying to find oh. what it was. It's up a little bit more. It should be above the horse one, above that one. Oh, right there in the middle. That's kind of like a Zentangle thing. Cool. Okay. Called, like. You can do it different ways to where you can draw the outline shapes. It's uh -huh. kind of like the idea that you, you had um, that we could collab uh -huh. on. You kind of draw the, the random shapes, and then you can fill whatever inside of it. Um, a lot of yeah. people do it to, like, help relax. Like, if you're going through artist block and you have no idea what to create, just kind of draw whatever pattern over and over inside of it. Cool. Hey, how do you make these? Um, these? Oh, I, I think I just found them online. And I copied and pasted it because oh. I could not figure out how to type that in on my computer because yeah, people have all these different shapes and stuff and I would just find them online and then put it on there because it help, helps kind of separate it, make it stand out more. Okay. I see your thoughts there. Huh? Cool. Neat, man. Um, 
what uh anything going forward that you're wanting to try out or mm -hmm. focus more on i've i've been wanting to focus more on i haven't actually really started hardly yet i did like maybe one oil painting and huh. it i have a hard time working with color i've always been really good with working with no black and white or abstract and when you think in terms of just black and white when you throw in color it's like you know, there's millions and millions, there's like limitless different colors. So there's all those other things that you add to it and it changes so many things. Yeah. So I, I tried to do uh, oil painting and I kind of made it like abstract. And I was like, you know, this is way harder than I thought it was. And I thought to myself, how do these people like do these paintings? Like I'm trying to think of it, like how do they do this? Like you have to spend so much, and I had so much respect for how much time they spent on it. Like you look at the old paintings of like, um, uh, uh, da Vinci or um, Ronan yeah. Spash or Michelangelo and you're like like I look at my painting I'm doing I look at that and I'm like that's like the size of my entire apartment in square feet and they did that you know in a couple of months and here's taking me that same amount of time to do something like <laughs> <laughs> so it makes you really appreciate you know the amount of effort they put into it yeah I did I don't do really intricate painting very often but the one that I did do, let's see if I can find it on here, um, uh, is of The Last Supper, ironically, that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. I think that was Da Vinci. I think I've seen something in that one image. It was beside the one of the guy that you did the drawing of or the... Oh, oh, was it? Okay. I think it was um, up a little bit. Up, up, up. Oh, yeah. The one okay, in the so middle there. Looks like right. The Last Supper beside it. Yep. Okay. So I will let, let me find a better picture of that. Um, here's my page again. Okay. All right. So here it is. Um, yeah. So this was cool. I did it for a seminary class, mm -hmm. uh, like art and the Bible class. And the idea was that who would be at the last supper if, if Jesus had last supper mm -hmm. today in modern terms, and I put <laughs> the homeless man in the very center, like Jesus yeah. was basically homeless. I think if I understand right, we have like a gender bending couple people over mm -hmm. here, cross dressing, alcoholic, a homeless person, a, a prostitute, an immigrant, um, an abused African-American girl, um, a pasty white employee, mcdonald's employee with a hearing aid a skater mm -hmm. um haitian immigrant um all these people oh and the one person that is too uncomfortable to sit at this table is the one that i made look like a mega church pastor oh yeah he's the one who is just like oh this is i'm around too many messed up people mm -hmm. um, and he's the only one only one with a closed bible yeah. is closed and the rest of them have open Mm -hmm. Bibles as if they're actually listening to the gospel the way it's supposed yeah. to be. Um, but that got put on a, um, as a mural mm -hmm. 20 feet wide, um, down in, um, Fort Myers, Florida. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was an awesome experience to have it. Um, we blew it up and, and okay. put it up down there, got a couple articles, um, written about it just cause it's kind of a interesting statement, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that's an example of being able to take some of my, um, what I feel like can help people understand how to love people better and put it into artwork form. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen the one that was on the side of the building. I think it looked like the one drawing you did. I think I'd seen there. Oh, do you, do you oh have yes. One okay, I'll share it again. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I got to have to admit that that is just a mock-up. Okay. This one right here is uh, just a Photoshop mock-up. Okay. Um, but yeah, that's another piece of art that I have done. I was thinking something like this, Jacob, is what maybe I could give you a base piece like this without much color in it, and you could fill in your patterns okay. um, in some of those openings. Um, maybe we even take one, mm -hmm. maybe we even take this one, and I'll take out the color, and um, you can, I mean, if you want to, you can um, fill in some mm -hmm. in patterns in these little, like, um, crescents of in his beard, um, or we could talk about it. Whatever uh, works mm -hmm. best, but that might be cool. Cool collaboration. Um, yeah, we could brainstorm some more after the okay. call and figure out what we'd want to do.
What What is the longest time you've ever spent working on a piece of art? It would have been that Last Supper piece, and oh, that yeah. was like two weeks worth of work. Oh, wow. wow. Um, not straight two weeks, but probably, I don't know, maybe 60 to 80 hours. Oh, wow. I know some people put way more time into their pieces, but I just want to produce fast. Yeah. And it doesn't necessarily <laughs> take that many hours to make an impactful piece. So I try to maximize yeah. the time impact yeah. ratio. You don't want to spend like four months on it and then like no. end up not working or like you're like halfway through and you're like, oh, I guess don't. Or where you just try and get it done a bit quicker. But yeah. also enjoy it to where if you do have to restart of something, you don't have to be like, oh, yeah, well, I got to replan everything. So, <laughs> and you know, an interesting balance I've really struggled with is producing what I want to produce, mm -hmm. but finding what the market wants to. Oh consume. yeah, yeah. So I figured that if I can do fast art or like mm -hmm. um, you know iterate fast, mm -hmm. I get a, a quick test market so I can put it out there. People give me feedback. I know which one they like, which one they don't, and then I can make the next piece of art with that learned uh, market research to do it more in line with what they, what they might like. But I also have to be listening to my internal compass and my inspiration yeah. Yeah. Um, and combining those two bits of information to make stuff that I enjoy making that relays a purpose and is something that people want to buy or consume. I had an idea for something you could try. And yes. It was about the, the, um, the maps you made. Uh -huh. I had an idea to where it could be um, words and then a photo, but it could be like a flip book to where you have like an image or a map and then the next, like the page before is the words telling you about it and then the map, or you could have combined where it changes to where it goes from an empty map and you take a photo of the drawing each time you add something. So as you're flipping huh. through it, you see the drawing being built yeah. and formed as you're going through it. You know what? That reminds me yeah. of something. I, I just made a video recently of the, a talk that I want to give. Um, and this is probably exactly what you're talking about. I'm going to skip mm -hmm. forward in this. Mm -hmm. One second here. Okay. So this part. Is that kind of what you're... Mm -hmm. Kind of like that, but it would be like, I would imagine like if you printed it out in like a little book, the kids f could flip through. So yeah. like, cause they could have it in their hand where it's kind yep. of a combination of taking modern stuff and giving it into something traditional that, like, you know, kids uh, can carry with them and share around. So we, okay, let me, I have one other thing to show you. Yeah. Okay. I, I did a novel a couple years ago. Here it is. And in the bottom <laughs> corner is a flip book in the bottom corner okay. of this is a flip book so let's see if you can see so it's like this homeless looking oh, yeah. dude so you kind of know what page you're on just by looking at the image yeah yeah um yeah, so I am a big fan of what you're talking about, making the, the physical copy of like a flip book yeah. is so awesome. As far as, as, far as that uh, book goes, where could people find that or buy that at? Yeah, um, if you search Absent Landlord okay. on um, Amazon, I think even just in Google, it should come up. But you can find all the stuff on my website too, okay. rawspoon.com. So Photoshop is your main medium that you like to work with, right? Yeah, and that's partly because um, – so I have this um, Cintiq, which is mm -hmm. a um, Wacom product, and I can just draw on my screen. Yeah. I can undo. I can select and shrink and move around. It's just yeah. such a quicker, more efficient yeah. way of organizing art. Um, and then I can choose whatever color I want. I can choose brushes that look like paint brushes, watercolor brushes, ink brushes. I can mm -hmm. design my own brushes. So it just helps me do that fast iterative iterative oh, yeah. process fast and cheaply i don't have to yeah. pay for paper All the supplies and, and yeah you know, yeah kind of like um it's more convenient but you can just is yours one you can take around or is it one you connect to your laptop i have one of each um so i have this one let's see if i can actually point it in the right direction so you can see it so this okay. thing um i can put a a the this pen this is like mm -hmm. a pen that's built for it but then i have this other one which is similar for the road. Okay. Um, you can pop out the little stand and you can draw <laughs> on it with the same 
same pen. It's basically the same um, tool, but in mobile form. Mm -hmm. But it's actually cool because it can also be a computer all by itself. So you can yeah. plug it in as an extension of your of the screen of my Mac. Yeah. Or if it's not plugged into my Mac, it can be mm -hmm. a, a PC on its own. Pretty cool product. Yeah. I, I was going to mention something real quick and we'll go back mm -hmm. to what you're saying was that I, I actually have here in front of me, it's a drawing tablet. I think it's called, it's the XP pen. I think it's like 26 inches in Whoa, size. Cool. And when I bought it, I was just using it as a drawing tablet to, to use to edit thumbnails and to edit things for my video. Because when I'm video editing, I can use, like you said, the little, the little pen. Yeah, and I, didn't, okay. I, didn't, I had no idea. I didn't know that with the drawing tablet, you can click on things outside of the drawing program. And I was like, wait, I can, I'm like, I can use this for the video editor and everything else. Cool. And I started using it and it was really convenient, even though I don't have as much experience doing the um, digital art. And then I had it connected to my computer. I'm like, you know, I don't even need to buy a second monitor now. I can use yep. it as a second monitor and I have it right here in front of me. So it's so much more convenient than trying to have like 10 different monitors around me. A big yeah. stuff everywhere to where totally. I can't do anything with those. All I can do is see stuff on them. So, so what's the product? I'm not sure if I've heard of an XP. Pen. Uh, it's XP pen. I got it on Amazon maybe a year ago. Uh -huh. I think I got it on sale for two ninety nine. Oh, that sounds Seven awesome. Four. Yeah. Cause I have seen those, those Cintiqs yep. and because I'm always done more traditional stuff and Sorry. I see, one second. Okay, sorry. I actually pushed play on that video again. I'm going to look up the XP pen. Okay. All right, continue. Sorry about that. You're fine. Um, Because I'm not really that um, experienced with – um. can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Okay. It kind of froze sorry. there for a second. But yeah. I'm not that experienced with doing digital art, and I saw those, those – how do you pronounce it? Wacom? Wang? Um, I've heard it a few different ways, but I call yeah. it Wacom. Wacom. Wacom, Wacom. Uh, I saw some of those that were like the, the big, really large ones. And yeah. I was like, those are so expensive. I'm like, I'm just going to get yeah. the cheaper one first. And then if I want to move up, I'll do that. Cause I don't want to spend no two grand. And I'd be like afraid to touch the thing. I'm like, I don't want it to break. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's right. It's, it, the Wacom ones that they're the best product right now that's out there, but yeah. it is the most, most expensive one. The only way I could justify it was like, I'm going to be making yeah. thousands of dollars by yeah. using this tool right here. So. Yeah. so it's definitely a tool you need, you know, you wouldn't want to use something that's like an off brand that there's, it's kind of hard to find like advice online about how to fix something or if something's yeah. going wrong, you're like, I have no idea. You might have something that's doing a week. And like you said, trying to work on something really fast and you have, you know, some different brand that nobody knows about. And you just like, this one is a pretty good brand. I, I don't know of any brands that'd be like really cheap. Like say you got one that was like a 30 inch screen and you got on Amazon, it was like 50 bucks. You're like, okay, there's something wrong here. This must be <laughs> quit working in like two days. But yeah. yeah. The $300 sounds like a great price yeah. for a screen. That's also a pen tablet. Yeah. Cool. I'll have to, uh, I might look into that for my next, if this breaks down, yeah. <laughs> XP, XP product sounds way cheaper. Yeah. I was surprised at the uh, price differences in the screen size. Like I just got a screen that was two inches more and the price was like another hundred bucks. Whoa. And I was like, I was like, what the, and then the one that was like maybe two inches smaller screen size, it was only like $10 less. And that's weird. <laughs> yeah. Must be a demand thing. Maybe I guess I, I would assume so. I'm not sure. But it is nice having a second screen that's really big because in Photoshop, yeah. you know, you can fly out all these different menus. And by the time you have all yeah. your menus out, your <laughs> screen is like smaller working space. Yeah, I used to, I used to only have uh, I actually started my channel a little bit over a year ago and all I had was one monitor and I was doing all my video editing on it. So I would have to like have my video editing on it and different screens and audio and like all the windows were like this big. Yeah. And I couldn't do anything. I was like, oh, this is so frustrating. And then I bought a tablet and I was like, oh, awesome. Yeah, but, that's uh, awesome. Hey, what um, program do you use for video editing? Um, uh, DaVinci Resolve. Oh, okay, cool. I don't yeah. know that it's, one. It's a um, free video editor and it's really advanced a lot in the past couple of years because I used to use, it was old uh, uh, Windows Movie Maker. Can't do much of anything and I just like <laughs> cut clips 
like put them together, maybe add some audio. And my first few videos were like that because I was just using my webcam mm -hmm. and I was using, I think it only recorded in like 360 pixels. It's really low resolution. I was using Windows Movie Maker and my first few videos were like that. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this quality is so bad. And then you I, you made yeah. a bunch of them. Keep going. Sorry. And then I upgraded to the C90 webcam. It's Logitech. And then I was using that. But then the problem was, is that my computer wasn't um, fast enough to handle changing the video from real time to time lapse. It would take like 10 hours. So then I ended up getting a DSLR and I had no idea how to use DSLR. I've never even touched DSLR in my life. I was trying to figure out all the stuff about it, like about aperture, the f-stops, the ISO and all this. I'm like so overwhelmed. I'm like, I just typed online, like best cheap DSLR under a thousand dollars. And I found one and I was like, I don't know what lens to use. There's all these different types of lenses. And then no photography is also like a type of art where you can, you, you can also blend that in with doing Photoshop. Like you said, yeah. you know, combining the two, if someone's a photographer and they're creative, they can still you know, add those two things together. And so I bought the DSLR and there's so many settings on it. It took me a couple of months, probably six months to where I felt like it was efficient enough to use it. And when yeah. I first bought it out, like I was afraid to like, I was like slowly putting things down. Like, I don't want to break this. And, yeah. uh, yeah, like I said, it took me six months to figure out how to use it. But now that I've used it for a while, you know, it's, you know, it's easy. It's like, you know, second nature. Whereas before I was like terrified and overwhelmed. But it was a really big upgrade going from my old webcam that was low resolution to now like high resolution 1080p and um, all this stuff. So things have definitely mm -hmm. added up pretty quick. <laughs> So. Looks like you got a nice space, like good microphone for and good headphones yeah. for the podcast. It's great having um, mm -hmm. efficient, powerful tools. I also gonna, was going to mention about, um, this kind of goes back to um, being held back by things or holding yourself back. Uh -huh. Like when I first started, I didn't have very good equipment, mm -hmm. but I didn't let that stop me from you know, creating or doing things. Yeah. I, most, like we said, the most important thing is the message you get across. Someone can have the best camera you know, the best computer, they can have the best drawing tablet and everything. But if you wait around for that best product, thinking that's what's going to make you better, then you're just wasting time when you should just start, just dive in and start doing it. Yes. And because it's all about the content that you're creating, the drawing that you're doing, helping, you know, helping other people mm -hmm. and enjoying the process of it. Like if I worried all the time about how perfect the video quality is, I wouldn't be spending much time you know, worried about what I'm creating and doing yeah. you know, my mind to be in the wrong place. Yeah. Oh. I think um, there's a balance because mm. if it's a poor quality video that we've done, yeah. the potential I, for its reach is going to be lower than if it were high quality. Yeah. But if you don't get the message out at all, yeah. <laughs> then it's no purpose. I mean, yeah. So I think it's like, mm. especially as we do more and more and more, Every time I do a piece of art, I'm like, oh, that little aspect of that yeah. could be moved on. So next time it's better. Next time it's better. So yeah, to get it out there, yeah. get feedback whenever possible and improve, improve, improve so that yeah. the, the, the skill rises and builds your tool mm -hmm. set so that you can execute your purpose mm -hmm. more fit, effectively, efficiently um, every consecutive time. Yeah. At least, at least it's not like, um, you know, as I was going back to, about talking about respecting the artist of the old time and how they were able to create yeah. that without all the technology and everything. Like here, I'm, I live in an upstairs apartment. I've you know, I got an air conditioner. I can you know, eat whenever I want. to got all these other things that make life easier. Whereas back then, they didn't have that. And it's like, it makes you really appreciate what you have. Like if you're sitting here drawing, you're like, I want to feel like drawing, I don't feel motivated. And you think back to how it was. And it's like, well, they might not have been able to eat that day or that week but yet they're still creating all of this stuff that Amazing. i'm not as good as that and it's like how <laughs> we have no excuse <laughs> ah. or if we just go back to you know, like 2000 the old flip phone recording like 40 pixels it's like this big of a screen like, i remember i would take a picture on that yeah I, I didn't actually start having a phone or anything um i think i was till i was 20 the first phone i got was like a flip phone i just got like the cheapest one i could find like 15 bucks and it was a flip phone. The, the photo quality was so bad. I would take a photo of like a drawing. I would send it to somebody and it was like blocks of pixels and they couldn't yep. even see 
was on there. So to go from that to like what we have now, it's a pretty big change. Oh man, yeah. There's just jump in 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 tools for sure. Yeah, like I never even used Zoom before, and today I was trying to figure out how to use it. I'm like, what is Zoom? Never heard of this. People yeah. tell me all these different apps, and this is only within the last year. There's like hundreds of different apps people tell me about. I'm like, I have never even heard of this. So it works pretty good for interviews or um, video chats. Yeah, a couple different companies um, that I work with um, have suggested it. So do you do any um, uh, poetry? I yeah. um, used to do poetry. Oh, it's funny yeah. you mentioned that. I was thinking that this morning. Oh, I haven't done any poetry for a while. But you know, um, I know you do. You're talking about your your yeah. poetry. I'd like to hear about that in a minute. Um, most of my written medium these days is in the form of like quick essays mm -hmm. that I put on my blog. Um, you know, kind of like um, approachable essays talking in yeah. common language and stuff like that or in story format, mm -hmm. just because I felt like those just have the most, the best reception from people. Um, but w what about your poetry? What, um, what do you try to do and how do you try to do it with your poetry? Well, mine I would say nine out of the 10 poems I've written, I never saved because they would be on like old computers and I you know the computer quit working because I'd you know, save them on the computer. But even with that, most of the time it would just kind of be in the moment if I had an idea or something. Yeah. It would just be to get, get, get something out of myself. And like if I was stressed or angry or whatever, I would just make something and create something out of it. Yeah. And I started doing writing when I was about, now I really got to think because I know I started drawing when I was like, you know, five, about the same age as you. But as far as writing, I think I actually really started writing when I was 12 or 11. And after that, I just continued doing it just for fun. And I've only, I've only had one um, poem published. Oh, cool. But there was a mistake in the publishment. They, they actually picked the wrong poem I sent them because it was like really, really long. And so they, they picked like a, a section of it because it wouldn't fit in there. So like it just ends in like a weird way to where like, the, like you don't see all of it, but there's no big deal. At least there's something there and I got something out there, but most of it I just do you know, because I enjoy it and I want to improve. But I do have ideas as far as incorporating uh, poetry in some of my videos. So I've started doing that in a couple of my videos to where I'll have a drawing and then after I'm done with the drawing, I'll look at it and I'll see what idea or thoughts go through my mind from looking at that. And then I'll try to make a poem that lines up with that, that, that goes with it. Huh. Cool. So, yeah. I like that. Maybe there's a medium where you, you post something on Instagram, mm -hmm. but in the captions is your poem. Yeah. Or you um, do a video of you, like a time lapse of you drawing or something, mm -hmm. and you read your poem over the top of it. I just started yeah. doing this combination of words with images. Mm -hmm. I, I um, searched what is the maximum character count for mm -hmm. Instagram. It's like 2,200 uh, characters. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, cool. Let's write a story within 2,200 characters. Mm -hmm. And so I put this really interesting constraint on making a really tight story. And then, it, then I did a piece of art. Maybe I'll show you some of them. Okay. I did a piece of art that um, was um, – uh, reflecting that story. Um, okay, so here's one. All right, so, um, oh, so here's the video of me um, speaking the story. I'll just play a few seconds of it. Cole's grandpa caught Cole hiding behind a bush. You aren't supposed to be here, little man, he said sternly. Why do you leave before anyone wakes up? Cole's voice wavered. Where are you going? Can you see the, the illustration is slowly growing? Mm -hmm. All right, come on. All right, so there's um, yeah, so that is the story that I wrote to go along with this picture. Um, it's called Oaks of Righteousness, mm -hmm. and um, so I that that's my attempt right now to try to um, combine my words with images. Mm -hmm. And you'd be great at this because you have the video making skills. So you could combine mm -hmm. your, you know, illustration, animation, 
and spoken word. Oh, you have the micro, you have the microphone and everything. So you yeah. can, re yeah, read yeah, your I've poetry. Got, I've got, I think like, I've actually got two microphones here. I've got like a little lav mic and then I've got oh, like gosh. a boom mic thing. And oh, I don't yeah. see behind me, there's like all kinds of camera equipment. I've got to like organize some of that. So I'm kind of a mess right now, but, uh, but oh, yeah, sweet. I did, um, it, it it wasn't poetry, but last night I did. It was kind of like a, um, it was like a twenty twenty five minute speech thing I did, to mm -hmm. where the way I rearranged my apartment. Now I have a microphone. I can just turn around and I can just lay in my bed and talk rather than have to sit in a chair because I already yeah. for like eight hours. And so I had this you no know, idea that, you know, at night a lot of times before I go to bed I I can't fall asleep or have an idea. So I'm like, you know, why don't I just set it up to where whatever I'm thinking or something I could talk about it, and use that time productively that hour or two before I fall asleep if I can't sleep to make actually make something of whatever's in my head because a lot of times it's when it's when you're doing something that's outside of like a lot of times outside of art that you have a bunch of ideas like say you're driving somewhere you don't have like a piece of paper or pen with you or something and you have all these yeah. ideas and you're like what do I do with it I don't have it write it down or you're just out going to the store shopping and you have a bunch of ideas so I started carrying a little um uh booklet with me where I can write down yeah. ideas I have and yeah. I just I'll keep it in my pocket if I go somewhere. So good. But it was, it was a, a talk about commitment sacrifice and it's mm. about making a commitment to something and thinking about what it is that you're sacrificing to get to that. For huh. example, let's say you're pursuing something in life, but you might have to sacrifice some time with friends and family to get there. Yeah. And if they're understanding and they really love you, they'll, they'll be understanding of it and understand that, Hey, this is what you no, know, I want to do. And that sometimes I might not have as much time to spend with you, but I have this commitment that makes me happy that I enjoy doing than I'm pursuing and you know, you just want them to understand it. So it was about 25 minutes as I said long and it was a lot easier to, to make because I was laying in my bed rather than sitting in this chair all day. Like I said, yeah. so. <laughs> cool. That's but, great, man. Way yeah. to use what you got and be efficient about, mm -hmm. um, yeah, your productivity. Super mm -hmm. cool. So, um, you live in the United States, right? Yep. I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. Okay. So where are you, where are you from originally? Grew up in Denver, Colorado. Denver? Okay. Yep. And I got a job doing product design in Kansas, Wichita, mm -hmm. Kansas. Mm -hmm. I thought if I have to do um, Kansas, I'll really do Kansas. So I lived in this little house that used to be a barn next to some railroad tracks in this mm -hmm. little, um, little tiny town outside of Wichita. <laughs> but then I got, um, we got our, our company got bought by a company in Atlanta. So I moved down here about 10, mm -hmm. 11 years ago mm -hmm. and been here for a while. Although I'm looking for looking about moving to New York. So I think oh, yeah. that might be the next step. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you have probably a lot more opportunities cause there's a lot of art galleries and stuff there, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Is there, is there much of anything in Kansas? I've, I've had a, a couple of people I know that drive through Kansas and they say you drive for eight hours and you see maybe three houses. <laughs> it gets a bad rap, but yeah. um, like it's kind of it, in my mind, it's sort of known as the like most boring yeah. city in the nation or a uh, state in the nation. But honestly it is beautiful. Yeah. Like, um, beautiful for what it is you drive past those cornfields and you see the like the lines of corn mm -hmm. lining up as you pass which is just a beautiful effect and like the edge of the corn rows and the like sunsets and the big beautiful skies and it's oh, got yeah. a little town center that's got cool some cool innovative stuff a really neat river walk big sculptures and stuff so it's great for what it is man they're doing mm -hmm. great with what they got out there in wichita yeah so yeah. look, there's there's some states that there's a lot of stuff to do, but it might be always rainy or cold or something. So you don't have that good scenic, you know, area. Because like you said, as far as finding balance, you'd want to have something to wear. Like say if you're an artist that, that likes to paint landscapes. If ah. you live out there, that's like a perfect thing for you because just go outside, you got all the sunsets, you can paint all the stuff around you. Yeah. But you could do the same thing if you're in New York. You could like do watercolor paintings to where you're showing like a scene of cars and stuff. I see a lot of yeah. those. So that's great. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Draw where you're at. Yep. Be, you gotta be you Yeah. around you. Yep. So about how long did you, uh, live in Kansas? Uh, two years. Two years. Yep. Grew up in, until, um, I graduated college, mm -hmm. um, in Colorado, two years mm -hmm. in Kansas and then 10 years in Atlanta so far, 10 or 11. 
you, yeah, you you're, talk, you're in Ohio, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. There's cool. there's a lot of I'm trying to think of how to explain Ohio. There's a lot of cornfields. Probably <laughs> nowhere near as much as Kansas. Kansas probably <laughs> like a hundred times more corn. Um, I'm trying to think. Hmm. It's a very it's a very it's kind of a relaxing place, but you know it gets, does get really cold here, and that was you know a huge change for me from you know going from living in Florida to here. Oh yeah, I remember my first day here was I think sixty eight degrees, and I was freezing, and uh, and now it's like anything above thirty degrees, everybody's like warm. They like walk around in shorts on, and I'm still here huddled up with a heater on and everything. That's awesome. But um, yeah, I lived there till I was about fifteen. And then I moved up here and I moved to California one time and 2012, then I moved back here. So I've lived here about 15, 14 years, I'd say now. Oh, okay. It's been quite a while already. So, so that's home for you now, you feel like? Uh, I don't know. I'm kind of, I'm kind of like split up because like Florida was my home. Yeah. Um, it's kind of ironic that I actually have the shirt on today. We mentioned it, but, uh, that's I would say that's kind of like my home, but as far as I mean, I had a lot of bad stuff happen there. Okay. But most of my childhood, you no, know, growing up was from that area, and then now more of my adult life is up here. Yeah. But um, a bit of a transition going from it. So. Mm-hmm. And. So you're thinking about moving to New York? Yeah. yeah. I've always kind of wanted to do it. Well, since since college, and I thought, well, I want to live the type of life where. I set a vision, make a dream, and pursue it. So I'm making plans to be there by 2020. Right now, I think uh, maybe at least do it for three months next summer. That's, yeah. that's the plan. That's the thought. Yeah. And you said you got uh, went to college for engineering? Yeah. So yeah. my first degree was engineering at the Colorado School of Mines. Mm-hmm. Turned out it wasn't creative enough for me, and I kind of suck at it. So. Yeah. <laughs> did an industrial design degree after that, which is way more up my alley, more yeah. creative, and it deals with like the technical aspect of creating with the aesthetic. Mm-hmm. And now um, I just found I'm so much more efficient and quick at producing things that are simply just aesthetic. Um, mm-hmm. uh, just easier to spread, easier to pr- produce. Once you get mm-hmm. physical products, you have to figure out manufacturing, manufacturing methods, mm-hmm. and it's just harder to make stuff. Um, yeah. And I still, every now and then, will do a, a freelance client um, mm-hmm. project. Doing, I used to design um, everything from bird feeders, a lot of outdoor stuff, bird yeah. feeders, um, wind chimes, outdoor umbrellas, outdoor patio furniture, uh, fountains, mm-hmm. yeah, stuff you'd find in Home Depot usually. The, the first like thing I think of when it comes to engineering is like someone that's like, building cars and like all this like really technical really difficult yeah. stuff and you said the aesthetics of it would that kind of be related in a way to like designing a car like the look of it but also the functionality of it in a way would that be kind of the, like down the so yeah so yeah. um the industrial design that is their skill yeah they have to make it look good and taking into account all the technical factors okay yeah, that's in, that's what industrial designers do. I think I mean there's automotive design, but yeah. it uses a lot of the same skills as industrial designers use. Okay, okay. Mm-hmm. Um, I was also going to ask you about I'm trying to think how to put it <laughs> when like when you first started drawing, was there a? I think I asked you before. You said it was over time, but was there a certain like? thing that happened in your life or something that where you're like, no, I really need to help people. This is in my calling. Like you can have things happening as that's you know, your idea that you're moving forward. But was there ever a certain moment in your life to where, you know, this is you no, know, I, I need to do this. Um, and about what time was that? Man, mm-hmm. that's a good question. I think it was slow mm-hmm. growth into it. I remember when I was in like, middle school, high school, I had all these dreams of things I wanted to produce to make my creativity, just like desiring to get out. And every night, this was sad, but it was motivating. Every night when the sun was going down, it felt like a tragedy to me. I was so sad because of all the things that didn't get to be created. Mm -hmm. And then I think over time, I just realized that, you know, I can live my life for a purpose or I can just let my days come to me 
mm-hmm. and I can just kill time. Yeah. Um, I would much rather find what I have to give, how to help this world and figure out how to deliver it mm-hmm. um, to people. So um, it's a combination of wanting to be super creative and having that desire to create with realizing that like a life without a purpose just is not as compelling. Yeah. And it gives me a reason to be happy and find mm-hmm. it, it's like an engine, a fire within me, you know, instead of just like, Oh, what can I do? That'll make me happy today. Mm-hmm. It'll be, what can I do that I'm built to do, which makes me happy, but yeah. it gives to other people too. Yeah. I guess it's just a slow grown perspective shift. How about you? Was there something that made you think I need to lean on art and giving back through art? I would say it would have been poetry. 2013 is Mm -hmm. I would definitely then I went through um, a lot of injuries. I was training a lot for sprinting professional. I was moving towards trying to do sprinting professionally and I was going to see some coaches for it. And one day I was going to see a coach the same day I was going to go see him. I had um, injured my right leg. I tore the ACL F dislocated my hips, all these other injuries. And then I had to go through like, probably two or three years of physical therapy. There's so much more that happened um, about this. We could probably talk about it really in depth another time, but I'll tell you a little short story of it. So it was something that I worked on for a lot of my life that I was pursuing. And then I lost that. And then I kind of felt lost. I mean, I always did drawing, but at that moment in life, it was something I was really focusing on and I put everything into it. Yeah, And I was just lay, laying around then and I couldn't really do much of anything. I couldn't physically mm-hmm. do anything. It was hard to get up and move around. And I went from, you know, being really strong and fast and like, you just kind of feel almost invincible. And then this happens and you like, you have to have people help you. And it's like, then it made me think about the people that aren't fortunate enough that can walk or they can't move around. And then I'm like, I should really appreciate the fact that I'm you know, even alive at all, especially all that's happened to me. Wow. And then I was laying there and like, you know, what? I should probably just start drawing more. And then I'd lay there and like, I was in a lot of pain. I would try to get my mind off of it and I would try to draw. And then I started doing that more. And then I thought, you know, why don't I just take the the pain that I've gone through in life and everything has happened, put that into my art as a way to channel that more mm-hmm. and then to go out and connect to people and help other people that might've had something happen to tell me their story, how, how they got there and cool. what gives them a purpose in life and what helps you know, motivate them throughout the entire day. So it's probably you know, 2013, that incident when that happened, then there's a slow progress over, you know, over time from there. Then Dude, on. That's a good story. Yeah. yeah. Cool. It's funny, those shifts in our life and sometimes mm-hmm. tragedy is what opens up a whole new doorway that becomes a much bigger purpose that we never yeah. expected. Sometimes you got to try not to look at um, bad things. It's always, you know, always yeah. negative. You, know, you could have something happen to you where say, um, I'm trying to think of an example. Let, let's say you're out walking, right? And you go to cross the sidewalk and like, let's say you're carrying your, your drawing tablet, right? You go to walk across the, the sidewalk and you drop your drawing tablet in front of you and it breaks and shatters everywhere. And you're like really negative and you're unhappy about it. But imagine the same instance is if that happens, but imagine if you were to keep walking, there's a car that's speeding through and goes to the light. Now yeah. you can take that negative thing and think of it as a positive thing to where, you no, know, you drop your tablet. There's a car that's ran in front of you to where you would rather drop your tablet than have that happen. Yep. So a lot of times there's something that's negative that can happen, but there still can be positivity out of that, that a lot of people you know might not think about or see in it. So. Totally. Well said. Well yeah. said. Yeah. So do you have any um, other questions for me or anything you'd like to talk about or anything that um, I haven't covered yet? Um, I hope maybe we have a future talk. I think yeah. um, that's good for now. And I think we've probably hit a good time frame that people yeah. will have this little slot that they'd be able to listen yeah. to it. And um, maybe we do a follow up after <laughs> we do some art together yeah. and um, we can talk about how we discovered it and maybe other stories will come out at that time. I really All appreciate right. you, man. Thank you for reaching out and asking to, to mm-hmm. do this. All right, go ahead and um, after the talk, you go ahead and send me all the links to your account for, um, cool. do you, have, you have YouTube, right? I do yeah. have YouTube, yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. 
your YouTube, um, your book, and all the other stuff you can just send to me. I'll leave a link below the video that can find it. Um, and I look forward to doing another talk with you. And until then, it was nice meeting you. And uh, hope you all have a good day if you're listening. And I'll see you later. Thanks, Jacob. Take care, brother. Peace. You're welcome. See you.